I'm no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten, hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, 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 greatest, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he has the words of life. I will hasten, hasten to him, hasten so glad and free, hasten glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow in your keep singing or did you have a prayer time what you want to do oh you, your opportunities now or forever hold your peace <laughs> hey let's all pray together father we do thank you so much for another opportunity to come together and worship together as the church family i pray you bless this service tonight anoint it Use it for your honor and glory, and we pray, Father, that as we worship together, as we study together, I pray that you would bless each person here and encourage them. Uh, help us, Father, as we watch for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray as our message goes out, as our service goes out, that it's a blessing and an encouragement to others, and that people will be saved because we were together tonight. Lord, we pray for all the special requests before church. We mentioned the, the people who are on our hearts, the people who have special needs. There are those who are sick, and there are those who are having tests, treatments, waiting on surgery. And there are those who are making very difficult decisions. And Father, we're just praying for all of these. We're praying for those who have suffered losses. And Lord, we just ask your blessings, your healing, uh, your help, your presence, your power, your grace. Lord, all these things that you'd meet these needs in a way that would bring you glory and would strengthen our faith. Now, Father, help us to be strong and bold in our faith and in our witness, in our testimony. Uh, we pray together for our nation. We pray, Lord, you'd heal our nation. We pray you'd revive the church. We pray that Jesus would be lifted up in all things, especially now in our service. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
and making my way to the throne. And there I'll stand in the presence of God alone. Yeah. Hey. 
All right. We'll get it all together here sooner or later, won't we? Uh, sometimes it takes us just a little while to get everything going. Uh, as a matter of fact, just, uh, well, five minutes ago or just before I was going to get up, Rick said, remind him about the offering. Now, do you think I thought of that? That was five minutes. That's a lot of time for things to get up in this head. And so I didn't. So I am now. Don't forget the offering boxes out there. I just throw something in there as you leave. And uh, like Jesus, we'll be standing there watching. No, I'm just kidding. No, we won't. We, no, no, no. We won't be doing that. Now, next, uh, next Sunday at 5 p.m., we're having another youth uh, workers meeting. We need everybody. You're interested in helping with a van a driver or a guard, we call them, or a teacher or a guard, uh, we call them. We just need helpers uh, for uh, whatever we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. We have a plan, and we'll be uh, breaking the news to you about that. We still need a couple of pieces of information. So if you would, you would come and help us, uh, you'd be here next Sunday at 5 p.m. We'd appreciate that. And if you'd like to purchase a brick in memory of your loved one uh, for the memory garden, please let us know that by next Sunday, please, by next Sunday. Homecoming weekend is... Um, uh, the 14th, well, not the 14th anymore because we can't have the tailgate. The 15th, uh, that Saturday morning at 10 a.m., we'll have the memorial service. 10 a.m. on Sunday, we'll have our two-hour extravaganza homecoming service, uh, but then not the dinner. Uh, so we'll, we'll make it through this one. We'll have a really big one next year. Amen? And we might be in heaven next year. That'd be some kind of homecoming there. Uh, remember this week now, I'm counting on you to pray, to fast and pray. Now, we'll have a lesson from the Sermon on the Mount on fasting, but it's nothing magical to it. Don't make it harder than it is. You're just simply, you have a burden. You have a brokenness. And, and, and it's something that, it's like you can't eat anyway. It's bothering you. And so you say during this meal time, or, or you're sacrificing something, and you say during this time, I'm going to pray. And so I'm asking you to read 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, Nehemiah chapter 1, and then fast. And during that time, whether, whether it's a meal, whether it's a day, whether it's a couple of days, whatever it is, during that time, pray. Pray for the virus, that God would just wipe it away. Pray for the unrest in America, that we can have peace and unity. And then pray for revival of the church, the bride of Christ, the body of, uh, the body of Christ. Amen? All righty. God bless you. I trust you will do that uh, because the church needs to take part in this thing. Uh, we need to be there, right? All righty. In Matthew 24, let's quickly read a, a few verses and then get back. We're talking about the signs. Matthew 24 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that came to pass, of course. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then he began the, what was called the Olivet Discourse, and we started looking at the signs last week. The signs, we'll call them the signs of the last days, the signs of the end. Now keep in mind, there is nothing that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. Not one thing needs to happen. That's why we call it imminent, in that it, could, it, 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 is, it is an any moment thing. When, when Jesus, he, he told his disciples, and then when he went back home, 
they were looking for him to come home or come back any moment then. And so it's been 2,000 years. And, of course, there are skeptics, as the Bible prophesied, who say, well, you know, it's been all this time. Where is the promise of his coming? He is. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. We know he's coming. And so uh, we, we're looking for him, but these signs are for the, the last. The, it, it, it's to show us things, the state of the world, the state of the church, the state of Israel, the, the conditions going on in the last days, pointing to the last days. And so the rapture can happen any moment without anything. I can't tell you there's one thing. Now, when this happens, he's coming. Nothing needs to happen. He's coming. And it's, it's up to him. And he'll be here, it looks like, soon. All right, we looked at Jesus, the apostate church, Israel, Europe, uh, and the, the revived Roman Empire, Russia, and the Russian alliance. Uh, we looked at America and the condition of our nation, the perilous times in 2 Timothy 3, uh, the increased travel, increased knowledge, uh, and the days of Noah as the days of Noah, how they just went on about their lives as if nothing was going on, nothing was going to happen, completely ignoring God's warning until it was too late. And so tonight, let me just go over a few of these, and some of them I'll have some scripture for, and some of them, uh, some of them they're just, you, you need to look at our nation and just see what's going on in our world. Number 11 is the technology uh, in our world, the technology, whether it's internet, whether it's phones, satellites, whatever it is, you, you think they, you, they were talking in uh, Sunday school class this morning, uh, Jim's class, uh, a lot of people had good questions and, and good comments of, you know, they can keep up with us. They know what's going on. They, they keep up with you all the time. Today, now listen, today, and Brother Brad, I'll have to show you this and you can figure it out. Uh, but today I got a text uh, on, on my phone. Well, no, it was a message, I guess, on the Facebook that Sony had deleted or had muted 54 seconds of our program because they're not sure we had a license to, to play that music. I don't even know what it was, but 54 seconds. So Sony, now you think the executives of Sony are sitting around at a table drinking coffee watching the Bethel Baptist Church program? No, but they've got it all in their technology. They know what we're doing in Frenchburg, Kentucky. They know what we sung this morning. They know who has the music. They know all that. Now, we pay, by the way, we pay a license for all the songs we use, we thought. So we don't even know what it is. But 54 seconds they, they muted because they thought we didn't have a right to it. I'm just telling you that because Big Brother is watching. They know what's going on. And whether, you, whether it's going to be the chip in the virus that they create or whether it's in your phone, listen, they are keeping up with us. And so that's something to watch for because Revelation 13 says that the Antichrist will control everything and you won't eat, you won't buy anything you won't be allowed in anywhere unless you have his mark. And so the, the tech, people who find that hard to believe are, are completely blind to what's going on. That technology is here and has been here for years. It's just getting past the moral hurdle of doing these things. And, and the, the moral hurdle has gone from here to where you can step over it right now. Number 12, economic collapse. If I ask you, if I mentioned this in February, nobody would believe that there could be an economic collapse like we have had. I mean, we had the highest stock market and the best economy in the history of the United States. And almost overnight, it came tumbling down. And could have gotten worse. 
An economic collapse is totally, completely possible, and we've seen it happen right before our eyes. Uh, people are talking about, uh, you need to read, I saw uh, somewhere the comments of Dave Ramsey on a cashless society. And it was, it was very, very good. Very good. We're headed toward a cashless society. There's not even a question about that because all cash does is, first of all, they can use it now. Those who are in control of things can use, as we do, the virus is a new crutch. The virus is a new justification. And whatever you want to do, you can justify it with the virus. Whatever you don't want to do, you can justify it with the virus. So if you want to get rid of cash, cash is dirty. You're handling it all the time. Who knows who sneezed on it, who's had it, who's done this, who's done that. What's well, dirty, get rid of it. And, of course, then the day will come when, well, if you use debit cards, etc., those can be lost and stolen and all those things. So the only common sense, I mean, this is a common sense thing with our technology, is embed a chip in each person. Then you don't have to find your, you don't have to, you don't have to find your wallet. You don't have to find your cards. You don't have to find anything or look for anything because it's right here. Or it's right here and you just scan it, right? That makes sense. But it's a sign. And so the economic collapse is a sign. China. At one time, no one would ever have worried about China. And now we see they not only can start a virus and let it loose on the world, uh, they can steal uh, records, they can hack systems, and so China is now a major player. Uh, you read about them in the Bible. You might find the king of the east in there, or, or, the, or, or the, the, the armies, the armies that come up. Uh, the dried up Euphrates. Anyway, we'll talk about that. But China is a force. Watch globalization. You know what that is? It's like one world government. <laughs> I mean, it's just right there. Listen, it is all right here. In the tribulation, there will be one world government. There will be this fantastic uh, a charismatic person who is going to be the leader of the world when the world is in total chaos he's going to step forward or he's going to be thrust forward his power comes from Satan and he is going to be a man of peace with the, with the uh, I mean the rapture has taken place Christians have disappeared. There's some kind of fake news about whatever happened to all these people. Where did they go? What happened to them? And they're not going to say that the Lord Jesus came and took them back like He promised. There's going to be some story. And the world's in chaos and all of these things going on. And then all of a sudden, there's, they're attacking Israel. And, and their armies, those who attacked, are destroyed. And, and they run away. And it's awful. And this... This charismatic, incredible leader steps forward and he brings peace. He does the impossible, and that is he brings Israel to the table and they sign a peace contract. There's going to be peace. He guarantees peace for seven years and it kicks off the most horrible time in all the world. Globalization is, is a buzzword right now as people talk about how we need, we don't need to, to be the United States. We don't need sovereignty. We need to all come together. All of us come together. Well, they're falling right into the trap of Satan. It's prophesied in this book. And then first, Timothy. Uh, chapter 4. Now these are minor things here, but they're part of Scripture. So uh, you put them here. Uh, I mentioned already about having a, a marriage uh, destroyed. 
uh, as one of the others, but then, uh, as we talked about the perilous times. Uh, but then it says in uh, 1 Timothy 4, uh, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, uh, from animals, uh, which God hath created to be received uh, with thanksgiving in them which believe and know the truth. Now, uh, we all love animals, right? Uh, when I, when uh, we got married, uh, part of the deal was two cats. Yeah, I love those cats. <laughs> I love them up on the ridge uh, where they are, but... You know, we have gone to loving them, to worshiping them. And we've gone to where it's no longer right to eat them because you're talking about you're killing someone that's a part of the family. Or some, and, and again, I, I know that can, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not against that. I'm just telling you uh, how the scriptures how the scriptures even prophesy the little things, that we can no longer have things that God said you can have. I, I, I gave you these because they might be an ancestor or they might be part of the family or they might be human. And so that's just the way that our society is. Uh, the worship of animals abstaining from the eating of meats number 16 radical islam listen to this radical islam turn with me to genesis chapter 16 do you remember the sin of sarah and abraham do you remember that God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Well, they were old, and they said, Sarah was barren, and Abraham was old, so they were not going to have a son. And so they devised a plan, Sarah devised a plan, and so she sent her handmaiden, uh, Hagar, Hagar, into Abraham. And he had a son by his hand, by her handmaiden, Hagar. That was their plan. That wasn't God's plan. And God gave them a son to, uh, to a hundred year old Abraham and 90 year old Baron Sarah later when it was his time. God always does what He says He's going to do. But because of that sin, because of their lack of faithfulness and lack of, of believing God's promises and lack of trusting Him, in Genesis 16 and verse 9, And the angel of the Lord said unto Hagar, because they are running her away, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. This is the father of the Arab nation. This is the father of the Muslim nation. And they dwell in the presence of all thy brethren, Israel. Israel surrounded by radical Islamics, Islamists who hate Israel, who have uh, the, the, their whole plan, and I'm talking about radical Islam. I know there's some peace loving Muslims, and I'm not trying to generalize them. 
But they want to rule the world, and they do this. Their plan is by two ways. One, fatah, the word is fatah, which means infiltration. That means move in thousands and thousands and thousands and set up mosques, uh, set up businesses, infiltrate, and influence people with their religion. And then the other way is called jihad, and that is by the sword. So by infiltration or by conquering, they want to conquer the world, especially they hate the Jews And they call the U.S. the big Satan. They hate America. And they hate our way of life. And they want to change it. And and as we talked about Israel, and those who bless Israel, God will bless. Those who hate Israel, God will punish. They are infiltrating. Even now, as you well know, in the last couple years, they have infiltrated the United States Congress. And have made it very clear, very clear by their comments, they are anti-Israel. I'm telling you, you better watch these things. You realize that by 2040, 2040, 80% of France will be Muslim. 80%. Infiltration and the sword. Number 17, Christian persecution. Christian persecution. In America, Christianity is declining. Now, you may hear that we're a Christian nation. I think you might be reading some old material. We are founded as a Christian nation. There is absolutely no question we are founded upon biblical principles and upon Christianity. And upon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, But our Christianity is declining in America. And we're experiencing more hostility and more intolerance toward Christianity. David Jeremiah said that they're using five ways of marginalizing or minimizing. Marginalizing is one of the words. Minimalizing the impact of Christianity. One is stereotyping. You know on TV that every Christian is someone who is ignorant, who's a bigot, who judges people, who's harsh. They always have a bad picture of a Christian. Someone who's not really living his faith. Marginalizing, meaning... uh, Taking away some of the things that we do, like prayers. Taking away public prayers of Christians. Saying you can't pray to this God and you can't pray in this name. Taking away public prayers. Marginalizing Christianity. So we can't get there in the, in the public square and, 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 and witness through our prayers. Threatening. You know, if you're, they, they talk about how Christianity, where you're exclusive. You try to keep people out. We don't try to keep people out. We try to bring people in. There, you can't be any more inclusive than whosoever will, whosoever wants to, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. For the, he died for the sins of the whole world. You can't get any more inclusive than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is exclusive in that there is one way. The Lord Jesus Christ. And that's His plan. That's God's plan. Intimidation is another one. Intimidation. And then litigation. Taking Christians to court. And many of them them can't afford their business. Or their person, they can't afford to go to court. They can't afford a trial. They can't afford all these costs. And so, in many cases, they lose because they can't afford to fight it. Now, there's some important agencies like Liberty Council and some of those who will take up some of the causes but can't take them all up. And so, there's Christian persecution. Now, we're not getting beat up, not often, 
not in the United States and thrown in jail, uh, but we are being persecuted in very subtle ways sometimes. Number 18 is spiritual warfare. We're in a spiritual warfare. This is devil versus Jesus. This is uh, evil versus good. This is hell versus heaven. Spiritual warfare. Satan deceives. Satan is still using the same old strategy, and that is, why don't you be God? Why, why do you need God telling you what to do all the time? Why don't you be your own person? Why don't you take control of your life? He deceives. He divides. He divides. He divides even Christians. He divides churches. And they're over issues of faith. There's some people who feel uh, to, th they need to be politically correct. Uh, they, need to, they need to compromise their faith. And so we're divided. Those who stand strong on the Word of God and those who compromise the Word of God. And so he divides. And he destroys. He destroys ministries. He destroys the lives of people. He destroys the lives of leaders. He destroys. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy, whom he, whom he may devour. It would be so good if he walked about looking like a roaring lion so we would be afraid of him. We would run from him. But he doesn't look like a roaring lion. He devours like a roaring lion. He looks harmless. Oh, that won't hurt. Or no one will ever know. Or that'll be okay. And he destroys. Satan deceives, divides, destroys. And then number 19 is apathy. Apathy. People just don't care. They don't care. I mean, really, how many of us you think will go home tonight and give a thought about, is the Lord Jesus coming back? Am I ready when he comes back? Do I have loved ones who are ready? Now, I'm serious about this. There's so many. There, there, there's these things, and, and I've mentioned this before, where we have good theology. We have the right theology. But you would never know by the way we act. I mean, we know there's a hell, but we don't act that way. We don't act like it when we when we avoid telling people about Jesus and that you're going to hell. We have the right theology, but we either we act like sometimes that there is, either there is no hell or they're not really going there. But they are. Without Jesus, they are. And I know everybody believes that. That's the right theology, but I'm saying by our actions, we deny that. And we all believe that Jesus is coming back. We all believe that. And we all believe it could be any moment, but do we really live like that? Do we really live like that? I'm just saying that sometimes our theology... And our lifestyles don't coordinate. Apathy. Let's look at Matthew 24. I'm going to give you a breakdown here that I saw from, uh, again, I believe this was from, uh, from Dr. Jeremiah. I believe it was. Don't quote me on that. 
in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That was one of our signs of the days of, as of the days of Noah. He called this a cavalier attitude. A cavalier attitude. Meaning, we just go on about our lives. I, I wonder if, if our lessons on, on um, Revelation, w- w- will that change anybody's attitude? I wonder about that. Is it, just an, is it just an interest thing? Is it just a curiosity thing? Or, or will it change us? I mean, just think about this right now. All right, our world is crazy. I mean, you've got this virus, you've got this, uh, 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 this civil unrest, uh, you've you got the compromising uh, uh, apostate church. I mean, this is a crazy world. Now, here it is, so be it, the way it's all turned out. Alan is teaching about heaven on Wednesday nights. Jim is teaching about the millennium and a host of things on Sunday mornings. And here I am teaching Revelation on Sunday night. Now, is that a coincidence? And will it change us? Will anybody say, well, everywhere I turn, they're teaching something about the last days. Well, you think maybe there's a reason for that? You think maybe you ought to kind of give that some thought? We all believe he could come back any moment. We just don't believe he could tonight or tomorrow or next week. I mean, he could, but he won't. Right? A cavalier attitude. And then in verses 42 through 44. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. He calls this a careless attitude. Careless. Man, it's careless when you mess with your family. You know what? He said, if he had known, if he had known at what watch the thief would come, well, he would have, he would have been watching. It would not have allowed his house His home to be broken up. You don't want your family to be left behind. You don't want anybody to be left. Don't be careless with that. Man, handle the Word of God with wisdom. Don't be careless. You know the answer, you know what's going to happen. We want them ready. Amen. And then in verses 45 through 51, and this will be the last thing. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, in verse 45, whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, it shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He calls this a callous attitude. The Lord has delayed His coming. He's not coming. Let's don't worry about it. He is coming. He is coming. And Jesus told us, watch. We're here are 19 signs you ought to be looking at. You ought to be watching. 
And as they all are coming to pass, it ought to speak to our hearts. It may be soon. Am I ready? Am I ready in my own life to stand before my Savior and give an account of my service? Is my family ready? Are those friends ready? That I, have, I see every day and never say a word. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke or to stir up unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but listen, but exhort, exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. It is the time, it is time to encourage one another, to stir up one another. To get one another involved. He's coming. And next week, you know, we've studied chapter 1, the introduction and the, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus. And it's all about Him. And we studied the church age, chapters 2 and 3. We've looked at the signs. And then in chapter 4, John, come up here. Ah, that day's coming. We'll hear that voice. We'll hear the trumpet. We'll hear the voice. Come up here. Now we're gone. I mean, ain't going to be no goodbyes. You're not packing anything. You're gone. I mean, instantly, in the twink, twinkling of an eye, we're with Jesus. Amen. All righty. God bless you. Let's pray together. Y'all going to sing a song? Yeah, I'd like to hear a song. Give us something to focus on this week to encourage us. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word and your warning. And I pray, Father, we would believe with all our hearts that the Lord Jesus is coming back soon and that we would live our lives in a way that demonstrates our faith. And Father, I pray that we would be ready and that we would get our loved ones ready. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh.
I've seen the Bless you. <laughs> this